as promised, a quantum computer, but we did bring a fun science demo because as we heard today multiple times, uh, education is very important. Understanding kind of what are the quantum technologies so we don't get confused because a lot of things are confusing. As Thomas said, don't be he didn't believe his textbooks and when I was his student, sometimes I didn't believe him. So it's good that we have some things to, to look at to make us believe in physics and quantum physics and hopefully to demystify some of the questions there may be. So, you know, we're trying to distinguish between classical and quantum and we've been talking about, you know, in the classical way, world of waves or particles and deterministic. Um, while in the quantum world, we should be thinking about waves and particles as the same thing in some sense with probabilistic properties which affect measurement, which will affect a lot of the more advanced technologies. And then, you know, there's interesting effects like entanglement that can be harnessed, hopefully, in these new generation of quantum technologies to um, get completely new types of devices. Um, is classical music classical, quantum, or both? I mean, it's mostly a joke, but um, <laughs> uh, we hear waves, not single particles, and that's what's relevant to us. And I think that's kind of often the question with these new quantum technologies. What is relevant for the social impacts? Are the quantum aspects really what's changing the way we think about these technologies and how we should be thinking about their future? Um, but yeah, acoustics can be quantum, but that's not really relevant for us. Classical music is classical physics. But there may be some interesting things to think about with the help of music or acoustics to help us understand why wave properties could be interesting, why we care about you know, sensing and what the fundamentals of these things are. So why use sound as a quantum analog? Well, as you've probably noticed in, in this conference, our gracious host, Moritz, is a clarinetist, and he's invited a lot of musicians to play musical interludes. As humans, we like music. We can relate to sound much better than we can relate to, you know, electrons. Electrons have, at 300 Kelvin, at room temperature, have a thermo de Broglie wavelength of roughly 4 nanometers. Um, light has a de Broglie, or light has a wavelength of roughly like 500 nanometers. Sound has, can have a wavelength of on the order of one meter, 10 centimeters, stuff like that. It's the length scale that we can relate to. The equipment to produce this is very easily accessible. We can bring a speaker. We can't quite bring a fully functional quantum computer today, I'm sorry. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's a really good analogy. And what is an analogy for? Well, it's an analogy for the wave nature of matter. When we demonstrate a phenomenon with waves that you can hear with sound, the important thing is that it also happens with particles. People first realized this happened with light. Thomas Young in 1801 did the double slit experiment with light, and it took over 100 years for the experiment to, a similar experiment to be done by Davidson and Germer with electron diffraction. This showed that matter, like electrons, which we usually think of as particles, have a wave nature and can interfere with themselves. In fact, if we send a single electron or a single photon at a time through some double slits, we'll see an interference pattern emerge. And this is evidence that a particle interferes with itself. So then you can kind of ask like, does it go through the top slit or the bottom slit? Turns out that's not the right way to think of it. This has been replicated now with electrons, atoms, and even full molecules. And it requires a fully quantum instead of classical treatment. Now, we will do this first with an acoustics demo. Uh, we'll have two coherent point sources. You can kind of think of this like dropping two rocks in a pond and watching the water ripples go out. Uh, this will produce lines of constructive and destructive interference based on the wavelength and also the separation of the two sources. Uh, and this is an animation. In the lower left is a QR code and a link if, for an interactive, spread, uh, interactive graph if you want to play it around with a simulation on your own. Kind of the important things to notice are, is there this thing, thing of a laser pointer? No, okay. The important things to notice are, you'll notice um, kind of some faint lines on the diagram. In some of the lines, the red and the green line up perfectly. These are points of perfect constructive interference where the waves arrive in phase, and you'll hear, if you are at that point, you will hear a louder sound. 
Now, there are intermediate like lines in the middle, which are dashed, but you can't really see, where the red and the green arrive perfectly alternating, seemingly equally spaced. These are points where the waves arrive perfectly out of phase in its destruct interference. In the case where we have perfect point sources, if you're standing at those points, you will hear nothing. Oh, shoot, how to go back? Okay, so <laughs> uh, now we'll go over there to give you the um, demo that we've set up. Hello? Oh, okay. So this is the demo we've set up. We'll play a uh, we'll play a pure sine wave of 660 hertz. That's about an E, that is actually exactly an E5. And from these two speakers, there will be points where it will be loud, and there will be points where we can barely hear it all, at all. So uh, let me try and find one of those points. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to just find it first, okay. But ho hopefully you can hear a volume difference as I take the mic across. I think that's quiet. Loud. Quiet. And then loud again. I was, I'll stop annoying you with this annoying sound now, but hopefully that can convince you that interference is real. Now, you, you sh this is a very simple demonstration. There's much more sophisticated demonstrations. If you have noise-canceling headphones, well, that's exactly what they're doing, just at a much more sophisticated level. Now, on to Franz for the next demo. Yeah, so we just heard an interesting demo, and hopefully lets us believe that their you know, sound has the wave nature, and that's interesting, but we also talked about light, and. We heard today already about molecules and why that may be interesting. And you know that's all good and fun for science demos and believing in physics, but at the end of the day, we're thinking about applications and impact. So I thought um, one of the demos we could show is on interferometry, which is pretty much using the wave nature of light in most cases to make very precise measurements. So we can use the wave nature for sensing applications. Um, and that has actually created the most sensitive detectors in the world today. So think about um, In 1887, Michelson and Morley disproved the ether, which was one of the first and most important applications initially for interferometry. But we also have more modern applications. In 2015, LIGO detected gravitational waves, which, was, which were first proposed by Einstein, although he never believed that they would be found because they were so of such small magnitude, so hard to detect. But now we can use these very advanced uh, detectors. They're so sensitive, and in, I think in LIGO it was less than the width of an atom, the spacing of the detectors moved. And so we have these extreme sensitivities, which as we hear about sensing and how this is already maybe a little bit closer to applications, um, will lead to new impacts and applications that are usable in the near future. So here's a diagram of the type of interferometer we brought along, which is similar to what has been done with the Michelson and Morley experiment and with LIGO. You have a source and two mirrors, and the light comes back at this beam splitter and re-interferes to create the spot. Um, and so now if one of the mirrors, mirror one or mirror two moves, the spot will change because it's a function of the distances between mirror one and mirror two. And as I said before, this creates this extremely sensitive uh, detector. So we have one set up here, and maybe we can put it on the screen. Um, for the, the optics demo. So we, we have a small setup here, and there's a little spot similar to what you just saw. And um, it's so sensitive that if I just touch the table, it starts to move. So it's sensing the vibrations of the table. And I think um, if, if it's sensitive enough, maybe even a small breath will be able to be, be able to detect. So 
um, as you can see, we can abuse this wave nature of light for extremely sensitive detectors. In this case, with a very simple and small demo that you know, we set up very quickly, you can already detect tiny vibrations, fluctuations in air density and temperature, and you can imagine these much more sensitive detectors in research labs, what we're seeing now with interferometry for gravitational measurements, um, inertial um, navigation, um, a lot of applications that were not thought of before. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franz and Daniel, for that uh, fantastic uh, talk and the demonstrations that they will continue to do uh, during the reception and then you can interact with them. Um, well, the next uh, segment is the presentation of the ECTA, uh, which I will do together with uh, Eline, and we will give you uh, a short introduction to start with, Eline. Thank you. Um, so, as we learned today, impressive progress is being made on the development of second gener generation quantum technologies and also AI quantum hybrids approaches, um, and it's exactly at this stage that we need to think about the impact this, that these technologies can have on society now that we can still effectively shape um, uh, their development. At the same time, uh, although we have the power to shape them, we lack the knowledge about the specific issues that, we, that may arise by uh, using them in practice uh, beyond issues of uh, privacy and cybersecurity. So what would be really helpful at this stage are tools that support us in exploring new applications and uh, use cases and that help us um, uh, to think about what we need to make optimal and um, uh, responsible use of quantum technology. Now in the Netherlands we made a first preliminary step in developing such tools with the Exploratory Quantum Technology Assessment, the ECTA. And the ECTA is a step-by-step -step approach that organizations can use to explore the future of quantum technology from their perspective. So either as a potential user or in response to use by others. And the ECTA guides this exercise in three steps. So first, the first step is doing a quick scan of relevant applications. Then the second step is an exploration of the societal, technical, ethical and legal aspects of using these applications in practice. And the third step is defining an action plan. Um, and the goal of this tool is actually, uh, is actually twofold. So first is raising awareness about the potential impact of quantum technology on your organization. Um, and also starting a dialogue about embedding these technologies uh, within practice. Um, the ECTA is not a roadmap for developing a successful quantum application. It is also not a test to test whether your application is responsible, uh, but rather the steps in this tool assist you in exploring uh, the potential impact of uh, quantum technology on your organization. Um, and what we need to guide this, um, uh, this technology uh, for responsible and uh, successful use. So in that sense, it is a, a precursor or a, a first tentative step towards quantum technology impact assessment tools by the time that we have real world applications with real world impacts. Thank you so much, Eline. And we think that establishing a risk-based legal ethical framework uh, in combination with impact assessments, standardization, certification, and life cycle auditing of quantum-driven systems is crucial to stewarding society towards responsible quantum technology and innovation. And Technology impact assessment is about monitoring and determining the unintended, indirect or delayed societal impact of a future technological innovation. And it's also about capitalizing on opportunities and enabling responsible innovation. In time, we also need tools for assessing the impact of second generation quantum technology. And quantum impact assessments are important practical 
practical tools to facilitate uh, responsible quantum technology adopt adoption. Together with codes of conduct, best practices, roadmaps, uh, and physics de-risking tools, KIA instruments can be used by stakeholders to explore and analyze how current technological developments affect the world we live in. And implementing interdisciplinary expert-based KIAs can help raising awareness about the LSP dimensions of quantum technology and quantum classical hybrids and operationalizing our 10 principles for responsible quantum technology. For example, KIAs can cultivate a deeper understanding about the potential dual-use character of quantum. And as quantum technology matures, ideally these KIA instruments evolve in parallel towards fully-fledged quantum domain-specific sensing, uh, networking, computation, simulation, assessment instruments, either voluntary and self-regulatory or mandatory to optimize risk-benefit curves, employing modern system safety engineering explore, uh, approaches such as STAMP, rather than rely on reductionist risk assessment tools, whose inability to handle emergent properties make them unfit for analyzing the risks of complex systems like quantum. And we hope to work on developing these tools together with our transatlantic research partners in multidisciplinary settings. And in this spirit, we are honored to present our initial tentative step towards quantum impact assessments to Professor Urs Gasser, who has been a leading light in technology governance over the past decades, first at Harvard, now at München. Could you make a picture of this? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you. This feels very official, um, but it's also a lot of fun. So our plan is essentially to take um, this version 1.0, I think, right? Um, to our um, TUM Quantum Social Lab and iterate on it together with you. Yes. Uh, we also have a few partners of industry are already aligned uh, who would like to test out the methodology and refine it and iterate on it. And hopefully um, some of our international partners will join in this networked approach that we discussed earlier on the panel. Uh, particularly some of our partners of the Global Network of Internet and Society Centers and so we hope uh, to iterate on it, uh, to bring it to the next version and learn together. So thank you for the invitation and congratulations on, on the initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so welcome everybody. Then we continue. Uh, yes, thanks again, Maurits, for setting up this uh, event and this wonderful musical interludes and combining, you know, including students and concluding, including different parts of the campus here and, and uh, faculties from the campus. I think that's absolutely amazing. Great work, Maurits. Um, so yes, so Maurits asked me to talk with Urs a little bit about academia, industry uh, collaborations, and also about featuring a little bit what we are doing in Copenhagen and what our research plans are. And we will do this first, so I will talk about what happens in Copenhagen, Urs will talk a bit what, about what happens in Munich, and then we will both engage after that in discussion about the, I don't know, strength, weaknesses, weaknesses challenges, and opportunities of uh, collab collaborating with the industry and academia. And of course, if you look at the landscape, I mean, we see enormous investments being made, also by public bodies, by industry, by all kinds of sectors in the quantum area around the globe. Uh, the USA, Canada, and China are certainly 
uh, countries that are leading in the quantum computing adoption. Um, but major investments are also being made uh, in the EU um, and also by single European countries. I mean, some of the investments that have been done, for example, by Germany exceed the investments of the European Union. Uh, but even in small countries like, like Denmark, I mean, we have roughly five to six million inhabitants, so it's really, really small. We have a long, um, you might have heard about the Copenhagen principles, we have a long history in quantum technology and quantum computing. And, um, and of course, we have the Niels Bohr Institute in, in, um, in Copenhagen. Um, and a DK, also Denmark, is also selected as a location for new NATO center for quantum technologies. So the, it will be hosted by the Niels Bohr Institute. And uh, this quantum center uh, will include an accelerator site, an incubator where companies can make sure the technologies and bring it to the market with sparing input from world leading scientists from the Niels Bohr Institute and other Danish universities. And the center will also host a test center facility and the laboratory where quantum technology can be developed and tested, including components and quantum sensors, quantum encryption devices, and quantum computers. And the new center is part of NATO's Defense Innovation Accelerator and the North Atlantic, um, for the North Atlantic, called Diana. And Diana aims to keep the NATO countries' technological edge by promoting new and disruptive technologies in this alliance. So this is happening right now in Copenhagen. In addition to that, we also had um, major investments, for example, by the Nuvo Nordisk Foundation for developing Denmark's first fully functional quantum computer. Uh, so the Nuvo Nordisk Foundation has invested $220 million approximately, so 1.5 million Danish crowns into developing this. And I think the idea is to develop something like that until 2035, I think is the idea right now. I hope I'm not wrong there. Uh, also, major investments have been made in academia. For example, uh, we have a Quantum for Life Center established at the Mathematics Institution, which is run by Matthias Christiandl, who, by the way, has a history from TUM and also has a PhD from Cambridge. So he's a leading uh, mathem uh, mathematician um, working with quantum algorithms. And here we combine you know, quantum physics, mathematics, chemistry, data science to develop strategies for predicting you know, protein foldings, for developing um, new ways to work with biomolecules, and thereby the hope is to speed up and, uh, and, and improve the drug development process. So this is also happening, and he received around about uh, $7.26 million also by the Nuvo Nordis Foundation, the NNF. And then we also have um, an interdisciplinary quantum hub at the University of Copenhagen, similar to what you have at TUM as well, where we combine you know, different faculties, where also the law faculty is involved with me, where we have the social science faculties working on LSB questions, ethical, legal, social science aspects of quantum technology. So a lot of things is happening, but what about law? And there Maurits asked me to talk a little bit about uh, Siebel. So our center Siebel is anchored in Copenhagen um, also by a grant from the Novo Nordisk Foundation, which was about uh, the size of, uh, uh, what is it, $5.1 million, no, $6.1 million, which I received in 2018. Um, um, and there, with this money, I established a, a center for advanced studies in biomedical innovation law, working with Harvard Medical School, Harvard Law School, um, uh, with some faculties at uh, the University of Copenhagen, economists, University of Cambridge, and Nicholson Price at Michigan Law School. And there we, we conduct studies in cutting edge areas of, of uh, biomedic innovation, including um, AI in precision medicine, including uh, biologic drug development, um, all kinds of legal regulatory issues pertaining to gene editing, for example. So we have very, very broad, um, uh, we have a very broad focus area of research. So we look at both the protection of this, these technologies, but also we're looking at the regulation. Also including, for example, studies on antimicrobial resistance and all kinds of grand challenges that we find in the health and life sciences, pandemic preparedness, and so on. 
And this is running out now this year, so we have applied, or I have applied with my team, and uh, including also Glenn from Harvard, for example, and, and Urs will hopefully also play a role, and others um, have applied for a, for a new grant and uh, with a little top up. So we we know if we get this, well, we have a few very good reviews. So we are very hopeful. We know in June if we get this uh, money, um, and it will be a little more than we had before. Um, if we get it, and it's also with the Novo Nordisk Foundation. And I'm telling you all this because in this new Siebel project, we have uh, also a special project. Uh, sorry, this is not the best um, illustration uh, on the screen, but you can see we have a project here, uh, three main key areas, so one sustainable innovation, pandemic preparedness and antimicrobial resistance, and advanced medical computing, which is in the middle of, of the tree here. And this is a Siebel tree, by the way. It's a tree that exists in the, in the Amazon uh, jungle. Um, that's why I like the name Siebel. And it's used also, it has a dual medical use. It's used both for rituals and for treating you know, inflammations and diseases and so on. Anyways, and this the tree, Siebel tree looks a little bit like this, especially the seeds that you see there. So we, in this um, studies, we are focusing now more on, our, on bringing our high level impact that we have on the, on the WHO level, for example, on, on, on being cited in guidances by the FDA and these kind of things to the ground to look uh, how can we interact with the innovation ecosystem where innovation is actually happening and being conducted. So we will have a lot of uh, use cases here and quantum technology will play a major role in this collaboration that we envisage. Um, it will also interact within this quadruple helix or this quintuple helix of, of industry, government, academia, civil society and the ecosystem, the environment. Um, where we then try to study um, these um, different areas that I just mentioned. And um, within the quantum tech area, of course, the, the ways that we think we probably will be able to use quantum technology in the drug development and the drug design area are vast. Um, we're talking about data security, and protection with quantum cryptology of sensitive uh, information, often also personal information within the health and life sciences, screening, testing disease diagnosis, optimizing drug testing, clinical trials design. You heard about this idea to have digital twins where we can test uh, drugs and not only, not only moon vehicles, but also drugs. Um, nanotech drug de delivery, DNA sequencing, and so on and so on. So the areas are vast, and we want to look into very you know, broad um, areas with our research, uh, innovation ecosystems, um, so mapping the innovation landscape and, uh, and, and quantum technology and see, okay, where, uh, where do we see tensions and how can we facilitate collaboration? We just heard how important collaboration is. Where do we need more exclusivity? We are looking at patents and IPRs, including trade secrets, um, information law, quantum state information security, and data protection. Um, we are looking into the quantum uh, ethical, uh, legal, social, socioeconomic perspectives as well, uh, doing a lot of regulatory studies. So we have um, our application for this is actually, with all letters of support and so on, is 170 pages long. <laughs> uh, so it's a huge application. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I hope this will fly. I will know, I know by, by next month. So very, very tense. And, and uh, it's also board meetings and so on that we have to wait up on. And, um, and this is uh, the, the, we have like, yeah, this is the, our ideal solution, the, our, our ideal setup which we're looking for. And you see again, Professor Christiandel here at Quantum Copenhagen. He is the director of the Quantum for Life Center. And I, we hope also to share postdocs, interdisciplinary postdocs, so that we can not only work with those who are about to do legal studies or want to become lawyers, but also those who might want to become patent attorneys or work in the regulation of, of or in, in drug development as such. Uh, so the D Danish Technical University will be, allow, uh, will be involved, um, uh, the Petit Flom Center at Harvard, um, Cambridge, our Cambridge colleagues, um, and, but also um, uh, Aaron Kesselheim at MIT, Harvard, and of course also Urs and, and, and others. And also, of course, we hope to keep in contact also with Maurits here uh, in, in, in driving our research forward in this, in this area. 
Um, yeah, so I think I stop here and give the floor to Urs. Thank you so much, and I'm very well aware that I already had a lot of uh, uh, bandwidth today, so I, I tried to keep it really short. Um, so a bit uh, of context, so I want to introduce to you the TUM Quantum Social Lab, which is led by my colleague uh, Fabienne Marco. And um, the idea goes back to a bigger project, a bigger transformation at the Technical University of Munich, um, where we launched in October 21 a new TUM School of Social Science and Technology, uh, bringing essentially the social sciences much closer to where technology development happens. And it's a significant undertaking. Um, we are expanding the faculty uh, from um, 40 professorships up to 80 over the next few years. Um, we have already more than 2,000 students enrolled. And our job is particularly to build the bridges within this very large uh, technical university with uh, 52,000 students and create pathways for engagement for students in uh, technology, science and medicine who want to, uh, of course, also work on, on these big societal challenges of our time. And so that's what we're doing. Now, uh, TUM, uh, as part also of the um, Munich Quantum Valley, has a, a very strong research focus on quantum technologies, different types of, of technologies. And when we launched this school in 21, we were of course looking for opportunities um, for collaboration across disciplines. And one obvious uh, area uh, is uh, of course to uh, bring a social science perspective to the development of quantum technologies that is currently on the way, uh, also with lots of money and big investments. And so the way we approach this is um, to do it entirely bottom-up. So instead of applying for a large grant and set up a large center, we said we start very small and we start actually uh, with uh, students. So what we did is uh, we offered seminars, uh, a number of uh, courses for social science students who want to learn more about quantum technologies. Um, and want to work with us, um, which is faculty and, and staff, on some of the challenges we've been discussing throughout the day. And the student interest is really great. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to see from different disciplines that, and particularly now also from the social sciences, people who want to understand what is this quantum technology about, why does it matter, whether it's quantum internet or um, whether it's um, quantum computing. And so we're creating a portfolio of courses to really onboard uh, um, students from the social sciences who want to build the bridge into, into technology. But we also built the bridge the other way around and um, created an extracurricular activity for students, not only from the technical disciplines um, within TUM, but across the Munich ecosystem and build a program with cohorts of students uh, that work on challenges and uh, within this uh, quantum social lab. And it's quite exciting um, and really a bottom-up way to harness the, the energy and the curiosity of our outstanding students who, who care about very much the topics that we talked about today. Um, and so we hope to um, create the pipeline of next generation, not only researchers, but also decision makers, whether they go into companies or uh, wait, whether they go into the government, who are actually have some sort of a navigation aid and have, have a basic understanding of uh, this um, kind of quantum uh, frontier that we're part of and discussed about. The second, emphasis of this newly formed TUM Quantum Social Lab is public engagement and this obviously builds up on some of the um, insights we shared today already. So we want uh, very much also to bring different stakeholders together, uh, the public at large. We are currently, that's now where we are applying for grants, applying for a larger grant to create um, uh, learning ecosystems 
and team up actually with companies, particularly in finance, mobility and medicine, where we uh, can co-design programs where employees can uh, explore at their workspace what uh, quantum technology and in what ways may be relevant in the future. So it's um, trying to create awareness among a broader public, uh, but not do it some sort of in theoretical ways, but uh, get to the people where they spend a lot of time, which is their workplace, and um, co-create with uh, the leadership of these uh, companies programs to make visible and tangible in a way where quantum uh, may change actually uh, the future. So we're quite excited about the project. We have also collaborators with industry, which might be also the segue uh, to our uh, short conversation. Um, so I mentioned that students are working on projects and challenges. We're very excited about the partnership with Puzzle X, which is a, a, a large tech conference, and the winning team uh, from our students will be invited to Barcelona this year to present their quantum projects, very much like uh, we had a wonderful presentation early today by, by uh, Stanford students. So the idea really is um, to connect also the student population with uh, industry leaders. We also work with um, uh, XR Hub Bavaria, um, which is focusing on um, um, virtual reality and immersive technologies to see how can we use VR and XR um, to raise awareness and make more tangible what quantum technologies is about. Again, you see here the idea through partnership uh, to contribute to the awareness raising and, and, and also kind of educational mission and Terra Quantum, I know a, a colleague is here from Terra Quantum, will co-host with us a hackathon in the winter term again together with uh, students. So you see it's kind of bottom up, networked, uh, but a lot of fun and we're really exciting to see it as a pilot. Um, how we can bring quantum technologies to our students and um, again, bridge uh, both the worlds of technology development and uh, some of the societal, ethical, um, including legal and policy issues we talked about today. So that's uh, the brief introduction. Thank you. Yeah, and we, we wanted to continue. I mean, that was our plan, of course. I look at the time now. I want to talk a little bit about the challenges on the opportunities we face in, in collaborating with, with academia and industry, right? And just very quickly, if we have one minute for that, no? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, great, great. Okay, I lost a little bit track of time. Good. Yeah, yeah. So I think we just kick off with having a little talk, and then we also take in some questions, of course. And um, and one thing that we lawyers face in this area, I mean, it is of course something that is new to us. We have to be very careful and cautious before we make any assumptions. Or or, or, or or talk about anything that we don't really fully grasp and understand. So the trick is really to, to get this kind of understanding of this uh, and understand what is or could or may be legally relevant, either right now or in the future. And so I think it's important to create a culture where it is okay you know, to ask these questions that you always wanted to ask but never dared in this area. Uh, and this is also what I realized when talking to Matthias Christiandel, who is this, 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 you know, this brilliant mathematician uh, at the Quantum um, for Life Center, you know, to, 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 to understand each other. So this, and, and the, the same is also, I think, um, applying to make sure that we lawyers, we are not only the party poopers here. Right? You should also talk to us. I mean, it's rather that we want to make sure that we have a great innovation party, we do a lot of innovation, but we don't wake up with a too bad headache the next morning. So I think this is, this is how we should see it. So we also want to enable. We don't only want to regulate and to, we, you know, we're also talking about regulatory sandboxes. We are talking about, you know, making sure that the innovation is safe and efficient. Um, and, and there's always this balance between over-regulation and under-regulation. When talking to the industry, especially when it comes to legal academics, I think they're often a little bit afraid of that we are kind of messing up the party, basically, or the, 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 um, the innovation with, with making it overly complicated. But, you know, 
for us, it's important to show, listen, I mean, this is really important, for example, and, and cybersecurity, privacy, you have to think about these legal implications uh, there as well. So this is, I think, one point with, which is important. The other point I wanted to quickly mention is that scientific freedom, scientific independence is, of course, absolutely crucial to us academics. And even though the Novartis Foundation, which is, which is so far really funded, given us really generous funds, have never ever tried to influence our research. So sometimes our database research is, is, is helpful to, 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 to many um, actors in the field. Sometimes you also show things that are not so nice and that is maybe not in the interest of, 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 of major profits. Uh, but this is, um, is accepted by the foundation. I think that is, that is fantastic that we can really, that we're really free as, um, as scientists. And the last point, um, uh, I wanted to make is, um, well, I just had it in my mind, but I forgot it actually. <laughs> uh, I give it over to you and then I'm, I might get back to what I wanted to say. Sure. Point, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, appreciate, I appreciate some sort of the framing and also the points that you made about uh, our cautious approach especially if the work we're talking about is some sort of touching up on policies mm -hmm. and governance and, and even law. So obviously um, industry collaborations are, are, are risky because uh, of conflicts of interest, particularly when an academic institution receives industry funding. And mm -hmm. over the past 25 years, we've had a lot of experience accumulated mm -hmm. when it comes to funding from the Googles and the like who put money into internet and society uh, research. Um, at the same time, I mean, there's also a little bit of a puzzle to be very honest, right? Um, mm -hmm. One is we see, and I think we also want to see um, collaborations between industry and university when it comes to tech development. And in this early stage of of basic research, I think it makes a lot of sense also to have mm -hmm. money flows yeah. from industry and investments into universities. And uh, certainly at the Technik of University of Munich, there is a lot of, of collaboration going on uh, between industry and, and researchers, not specifically only in quantum, but more generally. And I think it's a good thing if we have appropriate safeguards in place. Now, the strange part of this is that when it comes to policy-oriented and social science-oriented uh, research, um, that sort of collaboration seems to be a no-go for all the mm -hmm. reasons you mentioned. Um, and, and that, however, brings the problem, well, how do you fund the important work that I think you all agree today needs to be done? And, um, and I'm not even so much worried about getting funding from foundations and public institutions, but I think you, you mentioned like how many hundred pages you're writing and how long you wait till you can continue the work. Mm -hmm. And one of the big advantages, of course, of industry funding is that it's often much quicker mm -hmm. uh, to get a company gift or to get a sponsored research than foundation right. money. And so I mentioned earlier today this question of trade-offs and right. this is one. And of course, the, the, the grant contract is very important that you have like clear you know, stipulations in place that allow you uh, full scientific freedom, right? I think what you also need to uh, convey and to, to, to explain a lot is that academia is not consulting, right? There's a, it's a difference. You can, I mean, you can have two hats on. We sometimes have, we're academics. But within academia, you're trying to find the best solution to the benefit of society. It could be a group of stakeholders, but it would never be a problem-solution approach, which is what a client would seek in a law firm or a company would seek. Right, and this is something that is not always easy to understand for <laughs> the people you're you're working with, right? So, um, but this needs to be distinguished, and that is also, yeah. I think, important, especially when you have use cases like we have. And then, I, I just a second puzzle I want to offer why it's perhaps more complicated than it looks like at a glance, where you say, well, you know. Uh, if we are in the policy arena, we don't accept any industry funding, which is what we do as well, and I've done at Berkman for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. But that works well if you're in a privileged situation where you have foundations and other resources where you can get funding from. Uh, but I know from own experience, it's much harder in other parts of the world where yeah. you may not have funding 
um, ecosystems as we have here, maybe here locally and, and in the US and in Europe. And so the trade-off gets really hard, which is to say, well, are you not doing the work or do you accept industry funding? Mm. And I think, again, you know, if, uh, if you look at the capacity building issues, the global asymmetry problems and challenges we talked about earlier today, the answer is suddenly more complicated. Um, and I think that's a reality too. And how do we navigate that? I have a couple of ideas and suggestions how we could structure mm -hmm. that, but we save that maybe for another time. But uh, just kind of to flag that there are real, uh, I think, real trade-offs and tensions and uh, it comes at the price and at the cost also for society to take this purist uh, approach. And that's a great point because I also just wanted to add the final thing I wanted to add is we also had a lot of requests to have uh, more involvement of Global South. And, uh, you know, and society and industry also has understood that, right? For some issues that we're researching, for example, pandemic preparedness, Global AMR, we need to have a one health approach. Nobody's safe until everybody's safe. And, and we need to also, you know, educate, uh, work together with folks in India and Africa. And this is also what we're what we trying to do, uh, especially in the AMR area, but also in the AI area. I just said it was in touch with the AI company, Nairobi, and it's amazing the work they do there. Um, yes, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Timo and Urs, for so sharing your experiences so openly with us. Now I'm uh, really excited to uh, announce the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Jeff Welser from IBM Research. It's uh, probably the only leading company we did not yet have uh, on, on a panel. Uh, uh, Dr. Welser is going to give a lightning talk uh, about uh, um, envisioning a responsible quantum computing ecosystem. Please give him a warm welcome. So thanks, everyone. Um, I have to say one challenge with being one of the last speakers is I keep changing my talk because you keep talking about really good things that I was going to talk about. And I keep trying to emphasize new things. Um, I like to talk, so I'm going to talk anyway. Uh, but I'm going to try not to be redundant and try and make some different points than I had made originally and planned. Uh, I, w I do want to start with this application question, though, because I think that's actually one of the things that's really important to think about for quantum computing. And people have touched on it already. But if you look at it from a high level, in the white circle in the middle is what we would call the easy problems. These are problems that we can address with classical computers. Doesn't mean they're easy for us to do our heads, but we know how to do them with classical systems. And there's that large light blue circle, which is problems we can't address adequately today. And in fact, uh, they, many of them are mathematically hard. You can prove that you cannot possibly ever get a large enough classical system to actually solve that problem at that scale because they grow exponentially in the number of factors. That dark blue oval is what we call the sort of quantum possible uh, uh, problems. So these are problems that we believe can be actually mapped onto a quantum system and become tractable. And you can see obviously all the easy problems you could put on a quantum system, but there's a large subset of the hard problems you can also put on it. But not all the hard problems. So there are still mathematically provable problems that we, we from the theoretical standpoint, I believe there's just no way quantum can do any better than classical. So again, it's not a magic machine by any means. Also, interestingly, you see the oval goes outside the, uh, either of those. So we do believe there's probably problems we haven't even thought of yet that quantum can actually go in an uh, in a, a attack. Uh, and that's actually both interesting and scary, because that's, of course, there are some of the unknowns of what you end up being able to do with it in the end. Um, the, the class of problems, um, applications, uh, areas, anything to do with simulating quantum Systems themselves, so chemistry materials, very obvious. Um, machine learning and optimization problems you've heard people talk about as well. Simulating quantum mechanics directly. And of course, factoring uh, itself. And factoring is what leads people to the concerns around the ability then to break um, the encryption we use today uh, for any, any encrypting 
uh, transactions on the internet, you know, credit card transactions, or of course all the archives we have in our, in our uh, files and governments and companies. So I just want to talk a minute about that because from a responsible computing point of view, that is actually something we should, we should talk about probably a little bit more. Um, and just to give, give an idea, first of all, I want to say there's no chance that we're going to break the internet next, you know, next week without uh, anyone knowing about it. I mean, there's still a long road ahead before we really would have systems that can actually go and break modern cryptography. It's based on very, very large prime numbers. Factorization even on a quantum system will require at least hundreds of thousands, if not millions of qubits, and that's still a moving number. But you can see actually here that you know, the numbers are not super far out. And, you know, there's, there's been a whole bunch of studies by NIST and other people, and by 2031, probably one of the most concerning studies says maybe there's a 50% chance by 2031 that someone would have a system that could break uh, modern cryptography that we know about. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I think that's honestly a little bit early. I would be surprised if it came that fast, but it's interesting that people are starting to take it seriously enough that within the next 10 years they're, they're thinking about it. Um, so that's led, though, fortunately, to a lot of people focusing on it. And, and the reality I want to uh, say to you here is we already know how to make systems have cryptography that quantum can't break, right? You saw the way those ovals work. There is math, taking what we call lattice cryptography, um, that does not map onto a quantum system. So there's already groups working on this, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to this roadmap that we put together on it. Um, on the top line, you see that NIST, uh, which is one of the government agencies here in the U.S., but it's been working internationally, has been working on this problem for quite a while. And in fact, uh, just last year, uh, they had announced four quantum algorithms, or sorry, classical algorithms that are quantum safe, that they believe are uh, very capable of being able to uh, mitigate this problem for pretty much all applications, including so some that would work on the sort of uh, asymmetric types of um, cryptography that we use for transactions, some for encrypting, uh, uh, say, your tape databases for all your data. Uh, so actually, I'm very proud to say at least three of those were actually coming from IBM, and the fourth one actually we, we've been involved with. So we've been very involved with them from the beginning on how you go do this. And these, of course, we want to create standards so everyone's using the same one. So we've actually put together a roadmap you can see here of how we're attacking this problem uh, you know, for our clients, which includes most big companies and, and governments, et cetera, along the way. Now, starting at the bottom, even at the hardware level, you know, our mainframe systems, the Z systems, they still run 80 to 90 percent of all banking transactions in the world are still running on an IBM mainframe, despite the fact you might have heard they all disappeared. They're definitely still, still out there and being made new ones every year. Um, we actually have put in there, even a few years ago, hardware encryption capabilities where literally the encryption happens within the system. The data is never, at any moment, not encrypted except for the exact time when you're actually doing the processing on it in the, in the processor itself. But it's encrypted on the way in, encrypted on the way out. So it's as safe as you can get until we get homomorphic encryption and then it could be always encrypted. And we upgraded that in the latest systems to be a quantum safe algorithm. So already those transactions are in fact quantum safe. Um, and we also encourage all of our clients, if you have data you'd like to keep safe for the next 10 years or more, not too early to start re-encrypting your databases now or your archives now using something quantum safe because you don't want to have to wait 10 years and re-encrypt everything then. That would be very hard. And we know there are people who actually already today are stealing things that are encrypted, waiting, holding it a few years when eventually they can actually unencrypt it. Maybe they can go take advantage of that. So not too early to start thinking about that work, but you can still use your credit card on the internet for quite a while quite safely, so don't worry about that yet. Um, okay, so what about some good applications? And I think people have talked about a lot of these, but I'm just gonna go through a few. We do think there's some things that could actually be really good for the world if we choose to apply it. Um, so one is uh, fertilizer. Fertilizer is um, one of the leading causes of carbon emissions right now in the world, as well as energy consumption. It's a very horrible process that makes fertilizer to fix the nitrogen that you need. There are bacteria out there that do that for much less energy and much less carbon output. We don't understand the chemical reactions that go on there and haven't been able to figure them out. Quantum systems, we believe, are the kind of systems that you could start to simulate those at a much finer level to figure out how are they doing that and then how could we make catalysts that could do something similar. So something could actually be quite useful for uh, many aspects. Um, in general also, a, a new catalysts, for example, to make CO2 conversions more efficient. So we're capturing CO2, that's great. What do you do with it? You could sequester it or could you convert it into a synthetic fuel that then you could go use again so you get more of a circular economy going. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of banks interested in, in optimization problems. Yes, you could use it for high-speed trading. Yes, you could use it to shave a half price off, half cent off your bond price. That's all great. You also could think about using it for better models to actually think about the way economies work and the way you can be more efficient in the way we distribute, uh, distribute uh, money across the world. And of course, in uh, medicine, think about new antibiotics, new, new ways of doing molecules that could actually treat various diseases. 
But I also say in all of these, when we think about these, we, we have a group within IBM that uh, is under me that talks about responsible and inclusive technology development in any area. They spent a lot, a lot on AI, of course, but they've already started working on quantum. So like even in that, the case of medical stuff, so do we choose to use it just for the diseases that are profitable, which is, might be you know, the first place people would want to go use it for? There are a lot of diseases out there that aren't profitable. There are parts of the world where people can't really pay for it, but maybe that, they affect millions of people. Can we make sure we're using quantum for that kind of use as well? Um, unfortunately, you could also use it, for example, to create a toxin that targets a very specific human being's genome. So that's a poison that would only kill one person. Not a great use for it, we don't think, but that again comes down to some of the nefarious things that could come out along the way. And so we do think it's a very broad class of applications one has to think about when you think about what do you mean by being responsible with your technology. Okay, but one of the first things you have to do is actually get the technology developed and get it out there. We do believe from an inclusivity point of view, an equity point of view, getting it out as broadly as possible is really important. So we put the first uh, quantum computer on the cloud back in May of 2016. It was only five qubits at the time, but it was open to anybody. We had no idea who would use it. It turned out, you know, we thought get 10,000 users, that'd be great. We had hundreds of thousands of people using it within just a few months. And you can see now the stats, and these are already a few months old. They continue to go up. Um, and at this point, we have, um, gosh, over 25 computing systems are out on the cloud, many of which are still available to be used for free, many of which, of course, we also use with partners and things uh, for a fee, uh, and we have a very broad ecosystem we're building. But these are out there for everyone to go utilize along the way. And it's not just because we're being altruistic. We actually believe that by creating this ecosystem, it will actually advance quantum computing more quickly and hopefully make it more inclusive and more, to, more likely to be ethical and more, less likely to maybe repeat some of the mistakes we've seen in AI along the way. Uh, so we've also got a development roadmap for where we think we're going with quantum. And we started this back in 2019. I'm glad to say from the green check marks, we've made all the points out there. And, and yes, you can go back and see what we published in 2019 to make sure I didn't change the goals. They, they are the same. Um, we expanded it just, just last year with what we see going through 2026. So if you look just at the bottom, that's what people tend to focus on. You can see the number of qubits we're putting on a chip. So just at the end of last year, we got a 433 qubit chip out. By the end of this year, we expect to have one with just over 1,000 qubits. At that point, you can see we start to do something in parallel. We actually create chips with fewer qubits, but we start to interconnect them, first with just uh, classical interconnects, eventually with even quantum interconnects. So you have you know, quantumly entangled information that can move between chips. That's important if you want to scale up to larger and larger number of qubits, because you can't fit them all on one chip. Um, and actually, just uh, coincidentally, I'm going to skip forward and then back, we just announced today, literally today, so you can go look at the press release, a partnership at the G7 with the University of Tokyo and the University of Chicago. We're putting in $100 million with the goal of creating a 100,000 qubit quantum-centric supercomputer by 2033, so 10 years from now. Um, and we call it a quantum-centric supercomputer because you see there's classical computing and quantum computing mixed. Completely agree with the person from Terra Quantum that these things will be intermixed and you will get the best results from them, um, both because there are things that quantum does better and classical does better, but also because even running quantum algorithms, you want those classical systems right there because you'll be sending things back and forth very rapidly. So we expect this to be a, a goal. And so you think 100,000 qubits, 23, 33, about 10 years from now, there is, then we're getting to be really something that could be useful, depending on how quickly error correction continues along, how quickly the coherence times continue along. There are lots of ifs out there, and yes, there's still a chance we will reach a technical block that says we can't go any further. That's not out of the, out of the question, but we're very confident still that we, we, we have a roadmap ahead. I just want to go back and point out on the roadmap, we also have software, circuits, all sorts of other things, including services. You know, in the end, for people to really use this, the, we can't have just the quantum physicists using this. We have to have you know, consultants using this, people in data centers using this, uh, scientists using this who aren't physicists. Um, so we have a lot of layers there. The vast majority of our software, I'd say 99.99% .99 is all open source. Thanks to Alexandra for talking about our, our KISS kit um, open source, which is completely open. The community has been building it for us and with us uh, for the past five years. Uh, and and we, we think that is really important to actually make, make, get the algorithms we need and all the, all the technology we need going forward. Okay, so this is just a list, this is just a, a kind of an animation of all the people using our, our systems out there today, right? So every ping is, you know, somebody running circuits on it. You can see it really is global, all seven continents, 
Yes, Antarctica too. There was a blip down there in Antarctica early on. We thought it was a mistake somehow, but it turned out there was a woman who was down there in the winter. Scientist decided to teach herself quantum computing because she, you know, it's a long winter in Antarctica apparently. So she spent her time doing that, and uh, so we were pretty pretty pleased to see that. Uh, so in in a sense, this says we're being very equitable, getting it out everywhere. I also point out we have a huge network of actual members that that work with us. Obviously, many companies, startups, many universities, and in many cases, those universities, we've actually set up hubs so they can then go work with other companies and other people and other startups, because we can't possibly work with everybody. So we've come up with new, very interesting, innovative models on this whole collaboration point we were talking about earlier between universities and companies to, to really get this out there in a way that's, that's very different. So very equitable in some sense. Um, but now let's take a look at what's actually happening when we think about investments uh, that are going on. So this is from the World Economic Forum, we work with very closely in, in a lot of these topics, just showing what the investment is right now around the world in, in quantum computing, and it varies significantly. Um, you know, 15 billion in China, that's the largest number from any particular company, country, and of course that's you know, our, best, our best estimate of what that would be. Uh, but you can see, as we said, very different numbers, and you can see, uh, if you look at where all those lines are, very heavily concentrated in the northern hemisphere, right? So already in quantum systems, we're starting to see the north-south divide happening, right? And that's, that's not, not a good sign. And, we, and it's early on, how can we help, actually help in that problem? Um, and just going with another view, these are all the global nations that either have a coordinated national quantum strategy or significant investment in it. And again, you can see very heavily concentrated up in the northern hemispheres, very little down in the, in the southern hemisphere. So I think you know, this is one of the things we should think about addressing when we talk about responsible quantum computing. How do we help this? And it's not an easy problem. Um, I would say even within the U.S., we've been trying to be very active in getting our, our systems out to all sorts of universities. We started a partnership two years ago, creating some hubs at the HBCUs, historically black uh, colleges and universities, HBCUs here in the U.S. Um, we rapidly found that although we could put everything out there, we had to go out and do a lot more because they don't have the infrastructure that Stanford or Berkeley or other places have to consume this technology, even though we thought we were making it just as easy. So there's a difference between giving people things and enabling people to go do things. So even within, you know, obviously the U.S., very developed country and, and, and lots of good universities, even here there's a lot of inequity that we need to actually focus on if we really want to get it out to everybody. Okay, so responsible computing, here are the three things that we, we think we have to go after and think about. One, the impact is unknown. It is something we have to very much consider as we go forward. Um, there are very interesting opportunities. There are some very difficult challenges. Definitely timing is right now to be proactive. The responsible inclusive technology group I've got, we, although there's still a lot to do in AI and they spent a lot of time on it, they started two years ago on this because they said, we have a chance now to do this one right we did not do AI right as an industry. Let's do this one right. And starting early is really the most important part. So I just want to end with one uh, slide. We've been working very easily, uh, very closely with the World Economic Forum on this. They put out a report that we were part of um, just uh, last year, I believe it came out. Um, they have a set of core values and they have a set of core themes. So we're spending time now on those themes side, thinking about what it means. So sustainability, that's really not just the fact that it could help sustainability, but the minerals and elements and things you need for building these systems. A lot of the same problems we see in the semiconductor industry. How do we actually help that problem early on? How much power is it going to take to run these systems? What does that look like on the cloud? Um, how are we going to actually think about privacy, cybersecurity, um, workforce development I mentioned as well, getting the right people using the systems, and those people who aren't experts, how will they utilize these systems? So I hope that people do take seriously this idea that we can, in fact, have partnerships. Now is the right time to do it, and I'm happy to talk uh, during the reception more. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that uh, fantastic talk. We have uh, 10 minutes of break and uh, another musical interlude. Thank you.
Thank you. 